our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans. Welcome to our Louisiana Eats podcast series, Quick Bites. I'm Poppy Tooker. On today's podcast, we meet Noah Rathbaum, a spirits expert and author of The Art of American Whiskey. Noah introduced us to the world of whiskey bottle labels. As it turns out, those labels reveal a great deal about our cultural history from the days of Prohibition right up to present day. Noah, I'm so thrilled to be able to speak with you about your beautiful, beautiful book. It's just an absolute delight from cover to cover. And you point out that, you know, everybody's been paying so much attention to what goes in the bottle instead of the bottle itself, the packaging, the labels. Why does that interest you so much? Well, I, I think that is part of the whole experience. You know, we're, we're choosing whiskey or really any spirit, not just how it tastes, but also, you know, how the label is designed, how the bottle, how it's presented, you know, sort of like a cocktail, you know, it's, you know, a whole a holistic experience, you know, it's the glass, it's the garnish, it's the way that it's served. And, you know, for so long, Rightly so, people have, you know, been appreciating wine labels and old cognac posters and even cigar bands. And it was one of these things that was sort of overlooked. And, you know, I thought like, wow, like I saw a collection of old bottles and labels. I thought to myself, wow, these these are amazing. This would make a great book. And then I thought I should write the book. <laughs> um, you know, the, the sort of light bulb went off. And, you know, I the more I looked into it, the more I realized, you know, that I was really onto something um, and and some of the labels in the book have, have really not been seen in, in decades, you know, and if they've been seen only by a select few people. So it was it was kind of part detective work, part, you know, a treasure hunter. So it was kind of a, a fun experience. Well, the labels on those bottles, uh, many of them undoubtedly are what you would qualify as a ghost spirit. Yeah. What's a ghost spirit? Well, it's, it's a great name. It, it, it doesn't sound as scary as, uh, as, as you might imagine. But um, basically a ghost distillery is one um, where it's, it's closed or it's been mothballed, but the, 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 the liquor still exists. So like especially in Scotland because in, and in America there have been so many booms and busts over the period. It's amazing that we even have a whiskey industry in this country after all of the false starts and all of the, the cycles that, you know, a lot of distilleries have gone out of business. And, and now, like, you know, there are barrels that still exist from some of these defunct distilleries or, you know. Whole barrels. Whole barrels. So that, you know, some of the ones in, in the, you know, my book goes really from George Washington's distillery. But, you know, Old Forester is the first um, bottled American whiskey, which comes out in 1870. And that goes through the modern craft distilling era. And some of the ones in the modern craft distilling chapter are from Diageo's like Orphan Barrel Project, you know, where they're looking through their warehouses in both America and I think ultimately in Scotland and other countries, pulling out some of these kind of rare lots of whiskey from, you know, distilleries that they bought that may not be open anymore. And so so now like we're living finally in the sort of new golden age of American whiskey for both new producers, um, you know, existing producers, and now people are, you know, digging old barrels out and bottling that stuff or we're even seeing some bars across America buying old bottles of whiskey, you know, that, that they're finding in people's collections or at auctions and obviously something pretty common in Europe with cognac. But we're now finally seeing that in America with American whiskey. What's your experience in tasting some of these ghost whiskeys? They're, some of them are amazing. I mean, some of these, I mean, whether or not the brand still exists, you know, some of these old bottles, you know, it's it's amazing to see what a change in proof will do you know for it was very common for american whiskey to be bottled at 100 proof for a long time and while there are many bottled and bond whiskeys or other overproof whiskeys now you know a lot of them are 80 or 86 or 84 and you know even the difference between a spirit that's now available at like 80 proof and what it was like when it was 100 proof you know can be usually different and it's kind of a i mean obviously i get a kick out of all of this stuff so um you know, it's really fun. But even for somebody who's not as obsessed with whiskey as I am, I think easily taste the difference. I'm not, you know, one may not necessarily better than another, but it's very cool to sort of taste history. Well, an obsession in whiskey is a pretty much 
an American pastime. And you state in your book that the history of American whiskey is the history of America. Explain what you mean by that. Sure. I mean, it is one of these things where I realized, I guess, midway through the project, really, was that this book not only tells the story of America's, you know, whiskey industry, but it almost tells the story of the greater American society and that really so many of the movements that are going on in our society, whether, you know, it's the suffrage movement, you know, or civil rights or, you know, the changing of different generations or even artistic styles from, you know, Art Nouveau to Art Deco to the swinging 60s or, you know, whatever you want to call 70s design, all of these things are reflected in in label art. And, and, And a lot of it is you see this weird kind of friction almost between generations where the way that they live are changing and the way that people are drinking are changing. And I always say what your parents' drunk isn't cool, but what your grandparents' is is cool. So, like, we obviously that now with all the hipsters kind of going back to drinking highballs and everybody, you know, whether in Williamsburg or Detroit or, you know, New Orleans, you know, all these people look like as if they're dressing out of their grandparents' closet, you know, with uh, fedoras and suspenders. But for so long, like, people drank the same way that, like, you know, you get generations, like, in the 60s and late 60s, early 70s who are so separated from their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation that they want nothing to do with, really, American whiskey. They, you know, we see the rise of the American wine movement and the craft beer industry starts in the 70s and really it's i mean it's a bad time to be an american whiskey distiller because all these people are moving to other things vodka anything that's sort of different but you know it's sort of reflected in in the label art and also the marketing like jim beam ran a kind of amazing ad campaign where they paired older celebrities with younger celebrities you know different generations like orson wells and his daughter or you know betty davis idea was you know the tagline is something like jim beam generation gap we've never heard of it you know it's kind of i mean they're doing whatever they could to like get younger drinkers to try american whiskey again well they sure have them now don't they yeah it's i mean it's uh, when i started working on the book i knew that american whiskey was popular and probably continue in popularity but i I mean it's it even the popularity astounds me to now and, and to the point where really for the first time in about 25 years or so we were starting to see vodka's dominance in america weaken a little bit i mean obviously it's oh. it's a behemoth and is still king um but we've we've started to see a little bit of softening and a lot of that has to do with american whiskey and i mean it's kind of a reverse because in the 50s vodka was like something like one percent of all sales and now it's like huge and it's almost like you know whiskey and vodka will sort of perhaps maybe change places again. I mean, if, if this trend continues, obviously we've got a ways to go before that can happen. But, it's, uh, it's a very interesting dance, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly makes writing about spirits and cocktails very interesting as, as all of these trends happen and people find new ways to, to drink whiskey or they rediscover old ways. I mean, we still have a long way to go to where we were, you know, even as, as recently as the 1970s, which is sort of the high watermark for American whiskey sales in America. Noah, what did you find in whiskey labels that had to do with suffrage and civil rights? Well, I mean, I think part of it is is their effect, those movements affect kind of on the larger drinking scene, you know, and really one of the things to come out, I mean, obviously prohibition was a perfect storm, really, of, of different, different trends and different... Um, really forces joining together. And and one of them was sort of suffragettes, you know, looking for the right to vote, um, you know, people trying to um, uh, more rights for women. And and one of the things that comes out of prohibition is that for the first time ever, women are actually going to speakeasies. And like before that, women weren't drinking at saloons and bars. No, you couldn't, if a woman came into a saloon or bar. Right, I mean, obviously. She wasn't a lady. Right, uh, you know, to put it politely, and or she worked there, you know, maybe she owned it or she, or her, you know, her family did or she helped run it. But really one of the things is we see women after war, after prohibition, like finally kind of get accustomed to drinking at at bars. And, And in fact, some of the labels and some of the bottles 
you know, try to distance themselves from both the stuff sold during Prohibition and, and maybe even before kind of giving it more of an authentic, you know, uh, design and, and maybe appealing also a little bit more to women who are now drinking. Um, same thing with civil rights. I mean, I think part of it was that the, the 60s was such a cataclysmic era, you know, and you really see this ginormous divide between the different generations, you know, for a lot of reasons and in the 60s and 70s and almost one of these periods in America where society is so split on so many different issues. And really, I think, you know, some of the labels, you know, are trying to pull in design elements, trying to go away from the the traditional, you know, kind of folksy, you know, kind of down home, southern kind of influence that, you know, we see a lot in, in, in whiskey labels, obviously, and almost trying to see more modern and, and new and appealing to, you know, the, you know, the younger generation who had very different ideas than, than their, than their parents or their grandparents and, and trying to get them to think about it in a different way. We even see Brown Foreman introducing a, a, a white whiskey where they had filtered out the color of a whiskey. It was called Frost 880. And, um, it was one of these things that, I mean, now, obviously, distillers are kind of very big on white whiskeys. But then it was sort of an attempt to target a, you know, a younger demographic that had moved away or was moving away from American whiskey with a, this white whiskey. And it, was, it didn't work. I mean, I mean, I guess both fortunately and unfortunately, you know, for Brown Foreman since they'd invested a lot of money in it. But it was one of those things where, again, you know, I think people, it was an attempt to bridge that generation gap or get get that generation to drink American whiskey and ultimately really it, it didn't happen and even some of the products like uh, Wild Turkey American Honey Now was originally launched in 1976 and it's a you know a, a bourbon based honey liqueur and you know it was targeted at you know women it was targeted you know trying to broaden the category of whiskey and it did not work and they kept re introducing it and reformulating it for about the next 30 years and 2006 they relaunched it as american honey and it was i like to say an overnight success that took 30 years and you know and now <laughs> obviously there's all types of honey whiskeys and all types of flavored whiskeys no would you talk to us a little bit about the six brands that were allowed to operate during Prohibition. I think a lot of people think that during Prohibition, all liquor went away and all that was left was some really nasty near beer. Right. But there were actually six brands. Who were they and how did they get that privilege? To be honest, you're right. I mean, the, the Prohibition chapter is one of my favorite sections to work on in the book because there's so much to learn. And I didn't, I really didn't, think it would be that complex, you know, like, because a lot of these questions I never really thought about before. But when you look into it, you know, prohibition sort of outlawed the manufacture and transportation sale of spirits. But the government allowed a number of brands, including Brown Foreman, to sell whiskey for medicinal uses. And they were labeled as medicinal whiskeys because, I mean, in 1870, the first bottle whiskey is Old Forester, and Old Forester, you know, was targeted at doctors, not because doctors are great drinkers, some of them obviously are, but it was because doctors prescribed alcohol as a cure-all for a range of maladies, right? So, and they wanted to make sure that what they were prescribing was pure, because up until that point, you were never exactly sure what the whiskey had been cut with, you know, you go and you, you know, there's a keg in a grocery store or a bar, and you'd fill up a glass or a flask or a jug. So, through prohibition, you know, people needed a supply of so-called medicinal whiskey. So these brands were allowed to bottle medicinal whiskeys. And I kind of thought in my mind, are the bottles kind of look like rubbing alcohol? Like, you know, you go to the pharmacy today and you fill a prescription for, you know, uh, an antibiotic. It just comes in a regular nondescript bottle. I or you go to even the Apothecary Museum, right. and, you know, they kind of look like glass peroxide bottles. Right, exactly. And I thought, well, what, you know, but but in fact, the, the label art and bottle design, and, the, and the, a lot of them came in cardboard boxes, are absolutely beautiful and elegant and engaging. You know, they're beautifully, you know, ornate. And, uh, you know, one of them has, like, it's called, I think, Royal Wedding, and it has, like, wedding bells embossed on the side. And, Obviously, I mean, we, we all know what was going on. Like, this wasn't 
for medicinal uses, but for people who were having a wedding, you know what I mean? And, right. and it's labeled, you know, and some of them have just as, you know, sometimes you see ads like four out of five doctors recommend, you know, some of them are like four pharmacists recommend this whiskey, you know, it's kind of amazing. And there's a, one of my favorite labels is one from Four Roses from a pharmacy in Sparks, Nevada, and it has the pharmacy label on it. And the directions are clear still that tell you how that you're supposed to take it. Like, and as how's that? I think it was two ounces of whiskey mixed with one ounce of hot water. So essentially a hot toddy, which obviously is still a great cure-all for whatever ails you. Um, All right. So it's kind of, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, it sort of opened my eyes. And in fact, so much medicinal whiskey was sold that the government had to declare a distiller's holiday where they were allowed to make more whiskey to fulfill the medicinal whiskey orders, which you could only get with a prescription from a doctor or a dentist. Don't you find that sort of a curious parallel today with medicinal marijuana? Well, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of, you know, um, parallel. I mean, the, the the origins we were talking about just a minute ago, the origins of of whiskey were, you know, you never knew exactly how it was cut or you weren't sure if it was pure, obviously, is a, a concern in, in the illicit drug trade today. And one Absolutely. of the reasons why people want to legalize marijuana is is to make sure that what people are ingesting is has been certified and, and checked. And really, I mean, when you look back at the history of American whiskey around the turn of the century, people were very concerned with the, you know, authenticity and, and what they were consuming was not going to be dangerous. I mean, not only during Prohibition, but really around the turn of the century. And you see a lot of laws come into effect kind of regulating that, that are many ways still in the books, like what we consume and, and how it is and assuring people that what they're going to drink wasn't going to be harmful to them. Well, thank God Prohibition ended. And there's another chapter in your book entitled Life After Temperance. Right. So tell us how life was after temperance. Well, it's one of these funny things. I started thinking about, well, okay, Prohibition ends. Like what happened? Like what, like literally what happened that day? Like where did the alcohol come from? And it's like, I don't know. I found some of these amazing old articles, you know, one from the Times where a reporter had gone around the city checking in to see where, who had alcohol, who didn't, where it was coming from. And, you know, stuff was coming from cruise ships. So one of the one of the distributors had like an armored car that they were delivering booze around the city. One, one bar had to buy liquor from, quote unquote, a reliable speakeasy because the speakeasies overnight were empty like nobody wanted like there was no nothing novel about drinking a speakeasy anymore everybody like a whole generation had never experienced drinking in public so everybody wanted to drink outside you know so the speakeasy were kind of done overnight and um it was actually a pretty hard time to be a distiller and a drinker because after prohibition just about every distillery had to be rebuilt i mean they had sat for so long and you know they had been stripped of anything they'd be stripped of you know metals or whatever and you know, all of the distillers were scrambling to get capital. A lot of them, I mean, it's not like a bank would loan you money because, you know, the stench of prohibition, you know, still haunted the industry and it did for decades. So banks were very weary of, you know, or weary, I guess, of, of loaning people money. And, um, you know, we're scared of that. And obviously the depression is still going on. So it's very hard to raise capital to build a new um, distillery. So you have distillers finding people who have capital and then, you know, obviously it takes several years once you make the whiskey for it to age. So supplies were still very tight after Prohibition. And really what a lot of what people were drinking was stuff left over that had been made before. You know, you see stuff on, uh, I would found like a, from one of the control states, like a, a catalog that listed a lot of 17-year-old whiskey. I mean, obviously now we covet, you know, 20-year-old Pappy Van Winkle. But at the time, I mean, this was stuff that was probably tasted terrible, like just all the wood because, you know, the warehousing, you know, who knows how it was kept and probably way too long in the barrel. And so there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't drink. But people for the first few years after Prohibition, I mean, there wasn't a lot. I mean, there was stuff from Canada, you know, some of the distillers who had the foresight there to sort of start ramping up production and kind of flooded the market with, with Canadian whiskey. And obviously whiskey was coming from Europe where there was no real Prohibition. Well, another thing that you do in the book is that you highlight special families that maybe none of us have heard of before. And I'd like you to talk about who the Shapiras are. Sure. Um, I mean, I think their their story is a really interesting one. Um, the Shapiras, I mean, it starts 
with with Max Shapiro, who's an immigrant, a Jewish immigrant from Lithuania, who came to America like a lot of um, immigrants, you know, looking for a better life, you know, trying to escape the pogroms of, of Eastern Europe, and um, he was a peddler, you know, selling notions out of a out of a pack on his back in Kentucky, and he was so successful, he moved up to a, a store. They were called the Louisville Stores. He had five sons who, when they came of age, opened up a branch all over Kentucky. It was one of these things that, you know, even during the Depression, you know, Max Shapiro, his grandson, who's the president of Heaven Hill today, you know, says, look, even during Depression, everybody needed a pair of socks or a button or a zipper. So not only were they able to survive the Depression, but they kind of prospered. So when Prohibition was finally repealed, you know, they were some of the people who had capital who could invest in a project. So, you know, they partnered with some people in, in Kentucky who wanted to open a distillery. Um, you know, they, they found some of the Beam family uh, for a long time. They used to say there was a Beam at every distillery, and, and today there's still a lot. And, and two, you know, the distillers at Heaven Hill are still part of the Beam family, Craig and Parker Beam. And Heaven Hill, you know, the Shapiro family, you know, what that their project became Heaven Hill. And, um, you know, right now, it, looking back, it's, wow, well, who wouldn't want to open up an American whiskey distillery? But then it was really kind of a risky bet. You know, it took a lot of capital. You weren't going to get a product for several years that you could sell. They didn't know anything about whiskey. I mean, that wasn't really their business. So they were relying upon other people to help them, you know, guide them through that. And um, just as they sort of get up to start going, you, you have World War II. But, you know, in fact, Heaven Hill, you know, obviously persevered through uh, the war, and and now you know they make such venerable products as Evan Williams and Elijah Craig, and you know they bought you know Rittenhouse Rye and Pikesville Rye. So it's kind of an amazing story and tells a very interesting part of American whiskey and kind of even our own America's history. Um, and you know talks about you know their family is kind of it's kind of an amazing story but but also one that's familiar to a lot of companies founded by immigrants and kind of what makes America special and unique from other countries uh, that we have such you know uh, are, are the Shapiro's still personally involved they are still involved it's amazing it's the largest family-owned spirits company um, in America and it, they're still involved Max the Max's um, grandson the original Max Max L Shapiro is the president his children are now in the business I just um during uh, the Kentucky Distillers Association's Bourbon Affair, I hosted uh, a discussion among the Shapiro family members. And, you know, we had Aunt Anne, who was 101 years old. We had Max, Max's sister, and, you know, his children, um, Kate and Andy. Uh, you know, it was really interesting to hear about how it was, like, growing up, you know, not only Jewish in small towns in Kentucky, but also growing up in the liquor business. And, they almost learned from a very early age, you know, that there would be no family vacations. They were really like, as they said, like trips to visit the different distributors around the country with like a side trip to a beach or a pool or, you know, where they go to liquor stores, you know, when they traveled and they pull their bottles to the front. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an amazing story. And, uh, you know, it not only was World War II a tough time, but obviously the 70s and, and 80s were really tough for American whiskey distillers. And Max says, you know, there was, you know, he used to say, we, we may go up to that liquor store in the sky, you know, we may disappear. And it's kind of funny, all of the things that we're not selling in the 80s, you know, like rye whiskey or in the 90s, now there's not enough. Like everybody's crazed, you know, all over America, bartenders, drinkers, you know, people who a couple of years ago wouldn't have had no interest in talking about American whiskey now have all these questions for me about, you know, how to drink it, what, what it is, my favorite ones, where to get it, um, which ones they should buy. And, and, you know, they can't keep in stock some of these things, which mm. is kind of amazing. Well, it, it's an amazing story altogether, and it's a beautiful story. Was it very hard to find these labels? Because, you know, 100 iconic labels, and the labels, the, the range and the label dates go from where to where. Well, it, I mean, to be honest, it starts with, the first one of the first photos is from George Washington's distillery. So it's literally the ledger for the distillery that he built in Mount Vernon after he left the White House, which is an amazing document from 1799. So you can see what he was making in 1799. And Mount Vernon was good enough to share that um, with me for the book. And really, I mean, it's one of these projects that could never have happened without 
the help of a lot of people who were willing to look in file cabinets and uh, computer hard drives and scour, you know, back rooms and closets and tracking down collections, family collections of labels. And then, you know, it was one of these things where it was, it was a lot of people had very specific, some of the, you know, a lot of the companies had very specific collections of labels for different eras and, and others came from different archives, state or government archives. And even when I found a lot of the stuff, it was kind of a, the, the detective work became, almost came after I found the labels because the intellectual property rights have shifted so much over the years that, you know, it was almost like I had to get the person who owned the label to, you know, to sign a waiver, but also the person who owns the rights to that brand to sign a waiver saying that they were okay with that. And, and fortunately, not only was I able to figure out who owns what intellectual property today, but everybody for the most part was really generous with their time and their support and really excited about it. But it was, it was one of these things where going into it, I thought, oh, like, how hard could this be? Everybody has an amazing archive and they've got plenty of stuff. And it's like, as it turns out, because brands have shifted so much over the years and so much of this was kind of ephemera like you know and i hope that one of the things i hope that came out of this project is that a lot of the brands are keeping more stuff from today you know so that in 10 20 30 40 50 years when people are writing about it they'll be able to see what these brands their spirited dinner or tales of the cocktail what they were serving or you know their you know the ads that they're placing in magazines today or maybe commercials they're keeping and and you know hopefully they are archiving all of that amazing stuff because it really is kind of a time capsule and, and so indicative of what we're drinking and, 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 and how people are living. So how long did this project take? I mean, I got the idea several years ago and then really, you know, working on it, um, you know, exhaustively really for about the last two years or so. Um, but it, it was one of these things that, that sort of developed over time um, and, and, you know, kind of draws upon years of, you know, research and, you know, uh, obviously drinking of uh, fine <laughs> whiskeys. And... If you had to pick one label that was your very favorite, I know that's like asking about your favorite child, but I was just about which to would say it that. be? That's, this is my least favorite question. And then Sorry. the next one would be, what's your favorite whiskey that I often get? I'm not going to ask you that. <laughs> well, there were some that there were some, I mean, it would be, Hard to narrow it down, but I definitely have certain favorite ones. Um, some of the, the medicinal whiskey from the Prohibition are just so unbelievably cool. Like, you know, really Art Deco, amazing Art Deco labels. Um, there are also some funny ones, like um, Jim Beam did a special one for Braniff Airlines. I think it's uh, – and, and one for Continental. They were for minis, and they're just – you know, really cool. They did a lot of custom bottling back in the day. And a lot of those are really interesting to see the ones that they've done for, you know, that they did for different, um, you know, clubs or bars or restaurants. And some of those are really interesting mashup of fonts and, you know, typography and, you know, different art elements and design elements where you get like kind of a traditional label. And then there's, you know, it's one of them, I think is for like a Chinese restaurant and you get this sort of traditional kind of faux Asian writing that's, you know, it's this weird, you know, it's kind of how awesome is it that this restaurant had their own, chose their own whiskey. And then you get this label that's this kind of this weird combination of, of really, you know, worlds colliding, you know, or cultures colliding. So it's kind of cool. Thank you so much for making the time in your schedule to sit down and talk with us about the art of American whiskey. It was my pleasure. That was spirits expert and author Noah Rothbaum. If you enjoyed this Louisiana Eats Quick Bite, be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you won't miss a delicious upcoming serving of Louisiana Eats. Visit poppytooker.com for lots more recipes and delicious food ideas, too. Have a special request or a thought to share? We'd love to hear from you. Call 504-867-9128 or send us an email to louisianaeats at poppytooker.com. Louisiana Eats original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. 
thanks to Sarah Holtz, who produced this podcast. I'm Poppy Tooker. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our major sponsors, Camellia Bean, Zatarans, Rouse's Markets, and the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group. Visit poppytooker.com to see a full list of our partners. This Louisiana Eats Quick Bite was produced by Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. <laughs>